<coughs> and I've been asked to help lead a panel today on some challenging vestibular cases. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. Which is funny because we send them all to you. I know. How <laughs> <laughs> the tables have turned. <laughs> so our illustrious panelists, we have Rob here, Jenny, Peter, Matt, Daniel, I think Austin may be on his way. Austin is on his way. I think some of these hopefuls, Yona might try and call in, and I know Nick is in a really big case right now, so we'll see. All right, let's jump right in. So the theme is we're going to have GIFs that herald each case. They're all movie clips, so if you can guess the movie, you get extra points. Blair Witch. Um, yeah. <laughs> did you say that? Yeah. yeah. Nice. What is it? Blair Witch Project. And so what Blair is Witch. this uh, demonstrating? A nice example of? Oh, uh, Celopsia. Yeah, Celopsia. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, we're done. That was it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think that camera needs to stabilize. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Better VOR. So we have a 28-year-old male. He has a history of episodic spinning. Says that they could last near for minutes to hours. Spontaneous. No clear triggers. Had five attacks total until December 2018. When after one of those, he got oscillopsia. Oscillopsia constantly. Every activity, he was having this jumping, bouncing vision. It never went away. And he's also noticed that now he's having even more frequent attacks. So he's having oscillopsia constantly, and then these terrible spinning attacks. Now they're lasting mainly hours instead of minutes, like they were before. 28, no other prior history. What do you guys want to know next? Head trauma. No head trauma. Good question. Is he on dialysis? Not on dialysis. Very healthy guy. Ototoxic drugs? That's where I was going. No ototoxic drugs. Uh, Dr. Aliano, what kind of associated symptoms would you like? Oral fullness, hearing loss to this. Right. Is it with the, is, was there a change? Is it with the episode? Mm -hmm. So great question. No oral symptoms whatsoever. He doesn't notice anything that goes along in terms of hearing, fullness, tinnitus. Headaches. Headaches, yes. <laughs> medication, so he's got headaches. Yeah. <laughs> so his... Um, siblings and mother all have migraine. He says that he's never really had migraine before, but he had his first ever visual aura a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and he started to notice that with these attacks, lights are really bothersome to him, sounds are really bothersome to him. He needs to rest for a really long time after each one happens. So really interesting. Okay, what else would you like to know? Has he had any vestibular testing done yet? He has had vestibular <laughs> testing. What? <laughs> 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 Have I met him? But <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. the machine was broken. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. So let's talk about exam before we get to the vestibular testing, sure. if that's okay with you. Yeah. Okay. So I thought I'd put up a little constellation of exam findings that I look for, but I wanted to ask the panel, what are exams that you typically do in a patient who comes in who's having dizzy attacks? Anything at all? Look at them. Stand them up. Well, so, I mean, dizzy attacks, uh, as opposed to dizziness, chronic mm -hmm. dizziness, um, and we know there's the, the big three, you want to try and exclude a BPPV, many years and vestibular migraine, so your exam would concentrate around being an ENT, you would kind of concentrate around an ENT exam, mm -hmm. so you first look for, uh, look, examine the external and, and middle ear, um, and of course that would kind of come with an audiogram, which is uh, very good for the inner ear. Um, and uh, you know you complete your ENT um, exam, and then you also look at the other. I guess you call them pillars of balance. So you do a general eye exam, mm -hmm. you do a, a general um, proprioceptive exam, and a neurological <coughs> exam, but focusing on the cerebellar mm -hmm. um, uh, signs. Um, and that would in involve um, uh, gates. So some of them you've got here: um, Sharpen, Romberg's, uh, Fiduca, or Winterberger stepping test. Um, testing eye movements, uh, looking for nystagmus or evoked nystagmus, uh, head shake, head thrust, uh, and, and, and from there. Yep, I think that's for, the, for the residents, yep. if you ask something like this at boards, that's exactly how to handle yeah, exactly. it. Right? You go through <laughs> everything, not, you know, you start with an exam. Yeah. Perfect. 
perfect, perfect. right. Yeah. Breaking down all of the components. Perfect, <laughs> 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 visual, and vestibular. So I thought we'd go into a little bit more in terms of what we're aiming for with the vestibular exam. So here's a little schematic. So we throw these words around all the time, and I'm not sure we always know what they mean. So for example, smooth pursuit and saccades we usually associate with the VNG testing. So that's the infrared ocular motor exam that they're doing. Most of us don't have access to infrared goggles, so it's good to understand why the VNG can have a supplementary um, impact on your exam. And this also can help with your localization. We know smooth pursuit is actually crossing the neuraxis. So you have input from the brainstem out through the cortical inputs as well as the vestibular cerebral, cerebellar. So that's kind of your broad coverage. But then we get a little bit more specific with these other exams. So we know saccades are coming mainly from brainstem. It's very well preserved across many species and should be well preserved in most of your patients unless they have something neurodegenerative going on. We know nystagmus is coming from vestibular um, asymmetry. So that can come from nuclei throughout the VOR. And then VOR cancellation, I think, is something that we don't necessarily use all that often. So the idea of VOR cancellation is that you're able to override that very well-preserved vestibular ocular reflex. So just a simple exam technique that we'll do in my room is just put your thumb straight forward, focus on your thumbs, and you're moving your head side to side. What you're doing is you're able to override any sense that the VOR is trying to stay and catch and keep that um, fixation point in the view. So VR cancellation actually localizes to the vestibular cerebellum. So that's your flocculus, nodulus, your midline cerebellar structures. So that can be very helpful. If you see catch-up saccades when they're doing that, you should have some red flag that there may be a central component to what's going on. Um, VSR is one that I think is overlooked as well. So vestibular spinal reflex, this is a, a dual direction track. So you usually think of proprioceptive input going through the dorsal columns and very close by is vestibular spinal tract going to the vestibular nuclei. And we test that, as Peter alluded to, with the Romberg, but really the Romberg is more dorsal columns. So we have to take away some of that proprioception in order to isolate the vestibular spinal. So that's where matted Romberg or doing the Romberg on an uneven surface can be helpful. And then you can do dynamic vestibular spinal reflex with tests like Unterberger and Fukuda. Okay. So what would we expect in this patient who says he has constant oscillopsia and who has these episodic vertigo attacks in terms of exam findings in general? We can go back to these main categories. Negative. Oh, sure. it's going to be negative. I hope that he's got, like... Uh, if uh, catch up saccade with the head impulse test. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Because mm -hmm. we're thinking he has some VOR impairment since he has Pretty the oscillopsia. Yep, absolutely. So catch up saccades is one VOR assessment on video or on head impulse test mm -hmm. bedside. Mm -hmm. And if you know if he has one of these um, bilateral vestibular hypofunction spontaneously, you know, you close his eyes, he's going to start over, especially sharpened with a, a stressed lumbar with a push. Yes. Absolutely. So that's exactly what we saw. The vestibular ref uh, spinal reflex was impaired, so he had sway and Romberg particularly brought out when he was in matted Romberg. Vestibular ocular reflex was impaired, particularly in bedside head and pulse test. Um, what was probably not expected is he had some localizing features and a nystagmus pattern. Mm -hmm. So on his dynamic vestibular spinal reflex, we saw a deviation, so he had some tonic asymmetry of forcing him to one side, that's the Unterberger marching test, deviated to his right. And then on his goggle exam with fixation denied, so his eyes are kind of left to do whatever their tonic vestibular input is sending to them, he had spontaneous left beating nystagmus. Ooh. Does that help anyone with localization or make you kind of question what's going on? Mm -hmm. Right here. Right uh, Yeah. Yep. Well, right here. Or hyperactive. Right, exactly. So let's talk about both of those. So, Dr. Chirago, tell me why you got right here. Because he's got spontaneous left beating, mm -hmm. and the Hunterberg is deviated to the right, so that tells me the right ear is involved. Because mm -hmm. you usually deviate to the side that's hypofunctioning, right. and you have a spontaneous nystagmus that goes away due to the fast phase being the opposite direction of the stimular. And then, Dr. Aliano, what were you talking about? The converse, if you have a hyperfunctioning lesion, then it would be the opposite. Right, exactly. And what kind of conditions do we think of with that? It's two. It's really rare. Yeah. I mean, it's 
right after a stapedectomy for the first couple of hours in the early phase of separative labyrinthitis. Mm -hmm. And other than that, it's, for end organ disease, it's really not common. And Meniere's disease. So if you capture someone during an attack and actually vestibular migraine yeah. sometimes too, you will see that irritant phase exactly like you're talking about. Yeah, yeah very good. All right, so let's get to that audio vestibular testing. This is an audiogram. This is an external audiogram. So pretty vanilla. Sweet. We want some input from the audiologist. It's normal. <laughs> it's a... <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. Great. 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 You have a second opinion? Yeah. We got it. Nothing super surprising here, right? But a, a nice pan frequency assessment of cochlear function looks normal. All right, so speaking of frequency assessment, this is a grainy image because it's an outside test, but hopefully we can get through it a little bit. Um, Daniel, maybe you want to walk us through what you see, if you can see it. Oof, it's really messy. It's but really messy, yeah. yeah. Um, the clearest one is probably on the right lateral canal. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a pointer? Yeah, I can use my mouse. Okay, yeah. So you can kind of see that there's two like tracings mm -hmm. and um, the smooth one is capturing head movement in a head impulse test and the splotchy one is trying to capture the eye movement that happens in contrast with that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, this, the video head impulse test is just like your bedside except using a video to capture that eye movement mm -hmm. and what should happen is the, the smooth head movement should line up with the eye movement. And what's happening here is the, the head is moving and the eye doesn't realize it, so it doesn't move until later. So you're getting all these, what we call, catch-up saccades or corrective saccades because as your head moves, the eyes go with it and then the brain thinks, oh wait, I have to keep that image on the retina. So the eyes snap back, so you see it all delayed throughout. Oh, I've got a shadow, so like it should sort of go <laughs> here like that. And then these are the corrective spots right there. That sort of makes sense. So we do this in all three planes, horizontal, um, LARP plane, route plane, and the challenge behind the V-hit test is you have to go fast enough. You have to turn them fast enough that it sort of overrides the side that um, sends the impeding like signal to the brain. Um, so we try to, it's, it's sort of tricky, especially on elderly people who have maybe a fragile neck is trying to like quickly jerk their head in a certain way. Um, so it's not always easy to capture this data. Um, if, you know, goggles have to be super tight so they don't slip, things like that. Um, but this is sort of, I wish we had, I don't know if you have a normal one we to show in comparison. An, uh, we'll have one later. But this is yeah. really, all, like, we'll especially the one, the left posterior right up at the top is sort of all over the place. Like you can't even see the tracing really cleanly. Um, but. Right. Yeah. I hope that helps explain. Yeah, so essentially what we're seeing is catch-up saccades in practically every plane. Every plane or every um, You'll have to believe us because you can't see it at all, but the gains are very reduced too. And so we're seeing VOR dysfunction in every canal. And like Daniel alluded to, these are a range of frequencies, but ideally we're looking at 100 to 300 hertz. So this is high frequency fast, angular yeah. acceleration. All right, so we're seeing that in every plane, which... There had already been mention of maybe some bilateral hypofunction. Next test we're looking at is calorics. And so maybe Matt, you could tell us a little bit about calorics. Well, I mean, it's, I mean in these cases, we're trying to, uh, um, in effect, we, whether through use of the air or use of the water, we're basically stimulating your lateral semicircular canal. You know, the assumptions at this point, then, it's, it's we should expect to see a certain amount of saccades resulting from that stimulation. If we don't, what we're commonly looking for is make sure that the, one, we're seeing the stimulation, and two, that it's similar in amplitude across the two ears. And if it's not similar in amplitude across the two ears, then we call like a, a weakness at this point. So patients can have, if you have abnormal semicircular, lateral semicircular canal function, you know, um, in both ears, we call that a bilateral weakness. Otherwise, we're looking for weakness one side or the other. The other thing to keep in mind, you know, this is low frequency stimulation mm -hmm. as opposed to something like, you know, the V-hits, you know, we're basically we're stimulating at a much higher frequency. So this is a basically kind of picking up a different part of function that's a little more limited in some regards, but this is kind of the, the, the classic, uh, part of your classic V&G that people have kind of been looking at for, for decades. Yeah, perfect. 
And so one thing to point out, there's hypofunction both sides, all quadrants, so right, warm, right, cool, left, cool, left, warm, and then our total degrees per second only totals to 15. So that's actually calculating the slow phase velocity that you're able to trigger by um, applying the caloric, meaning warm air, cold air, um, and then calculating all of those four together. And so a lot of centers will use different cutoffs in terms of what actually counts as a low value for that total degrees per second. What's our cutoff here? I've used 30 as a cutoff before. Yeah, I've seen anywhere from 20 to 30. So I personally use 20, but you'll see 20 to 30 in most. Do you do ice water calorics in cases like this? So you probably should. <laughs> it's very technically difficult, and we try to get over that by doing a rotary chair instead, because that's the oh. gold standard confirmation for bilateral I, I, I can use CSF. I would go to the cafe and get yep. crushed ice, yep. get yeah. water in it, yeah. take a 30 C survey, mm -hmm. say this is going to hurt. I mean, those really yeah, stimulate the system. We've so done it like, in our yeah. clinic, but usually we've done it to see if like gentamicin has been effective or not. If you're using something to try to kill yeah. the vestibular function on one side because of someone's debilitating dizziness, mm -hmm. it'll be ice water that will try to see, okay, is there anything left because it's such a strong stimulus. Yeah. So what other, for someone like this, no, that's it's just low. We don't need to know anymore. One of the ways I use it in people who have chronic vestibular symptoms and very poor hearing or a labyrinthectomy ca um, candidates, if you get an ice water response, um, you know, if you get nothing on calorics or ice water, maybe the labyrinthectomy is not going to help. But sometimes they're flat calorics. With the ice water, you get something. Yeah. It's, it predicts that we're killing the rest of the labyrinth <laughs> in an already a deaf or very poorly functioning ear may be more beneficial. It, you know, one thing, you know, on a just you guys know when you're doing these things, you have to. Um, it's sometimes for inexperienced audiologists, you can make mistakes with not stimulating the ear appropriately. So if you're not basically heating or cooling the ear sufficiently, you know it's like you can artificially get an, an artificial low value. So you want to make sure, in effect, you know you you're doing it right. You know, so this way you don't have to give somebody a nice caloric. You know, mm -hmm. when you don't need it because those will really stimulate it, and people do not like that at all. Uh -huh. So. Yeah, maybe the canal is not completely clear. Yep. Maybe they have a very tortuous canal. Yeah. That's where air can have a lot of difficulty because we're Absolutely. not getting that straight shot in terms of activation. That's where water can be more helpful, that it can take those curves a little bit more easily. Okay, so super low frequency calorics, high frequency V hits. We're seeing bilateral loss. And then we have our C them, so our cervical vestibular evoked myogenic potentials. Just maybe Austin, quick one liner what these are looking for. Um, it's a response from the sacral, so we're just looking at a reflex response to the right and left ear. Um, see if it's present, and then looking at the size, and then uh, kind of like our cords, looking at symmetry as well, or also the threshold that we've got multiple levels of, of sound simulation there, so seeing how softly we can obtain it. So really useful for distant patients and also for total function. And what do you think of these? Normal. Yeah, they look perfect. Mm -hmm. And then our AC OVEMPs. What do we think? Hmm. Not there, right? They're not there. there. <laughs> yeah, not there. So this is um, theoretically utricle fat um, function. But then, I think Austin, maybe you did this one. Bone conducted. So can you tell us maybe a little bit about bone conducted versus air conducted? Uh, yeah. Um, so um, we just started using this. So we have a, um, a large, extra large bone conduction oscillator that can drive um, the skull basically. It's just like it's like a, doing repetitive tendon hammer taps on somebody's forehead, machine driven, um, and doing the same test. Uh, so we're picking up a reflex, but instead of using the earphones, or the earphones that we do, um, which have a really technically kind of low limit of how loud we can go. Yeah. Um, where we, we have a lot of people that don't have any response for a variety of reasons, and, and this allows us to go above that in a comfortable way. Um, and it's actually a better stimulus for the utricle and so, um, so yeah, these are uh, just a little bit response with a different stimulus. So. Notice just again another kind of recurring theme again, making sure that we get an appropriate stimulation for the vestibular response. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of so that's part of where we're seeing these uh, these bone conduction vents is really is kind of because so we it's well known that sometimes when we're stimulating say pure tones or other things coming off earphones, there could be a number of things that could limit our ability to get a good stimulus. And so we're looking. You know, this is, I, I speculate that the bone conduction vents can become much, much, much more common because it's a, it's, it's a more direct way of stimulating the otoliths as opposed to the, uh, the indirect route that we get when, we, uh, when we're using the you know, so. 
It's not as bad as it sounds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and hand repeatedly to the skull. <laughs> okay, so we're seeing vent presence, meaning we're making our way through the otolithic organs. They seem to be spared for the most part, but the it's unclear if bone conducted is just a better stimulus or if that means there is a little bit of weakness related to why the air conducted are gone. But for the sake of this, we'll say they're spared. Um, but our canal function, our rotary function, we're concerned about. Yeah. I'm sort of uh, I didn't know that bone conduction stimulated the utricle better than air conduction. I didn't really understand why. Because if his CVAMPs are strong, I don't think it's because he has conductive loss or something. Mm -hmm. Why would, I mean, why would it? Could, why would his OVAMPs be absent with air conduction but present with bone conduction? I think that's a great question that we're still trying to figure out through. That's, that's way louder than the yeah. heart is. It's a much stronger like, it's stimulus. Like delivering it. Yeah, this is, this is equivalent to a heart. So I know it's not, it's not hitting the cochlea. Yeah. I, 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 I know that OVAMPs don't show up on seniors. Will the bone conduction OVAMPs come up positive? So there's some new research showing that they are present at um, older ages mm -hmm. than the air conducted. So it hasn't been fully, completely sussed out, but it seems like it's going that direction. We have a, we have a candidate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, I, I mean, actually, George, I, I just funneled the paper like, look, hey, talking about you. some of this too, to, to yeah. Chris and Daniel and on Austin yeah. today, and then Austin was yeah. talking about the difference yeah, between trying. the bone conduction that I used to stimulate that versus kind of what we're utilizing. And so now we're kind of weird. Just, I was just joking like, should we write our own paper comparing this out? Because I think that would be a probably next step. Would we ever do bone conduction with CVAMPs? Um, I don't know, because CVAMPs seem to respond really well to air conduction. But is it going to be a gradation? You know, just like we How see. How many extra VEMs do you want to do? <laughs> 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 well, that's a separate test. Five, so. well, well, yeah, but I'm just thinking if bone conduction is a better stimulation for OVEMPs, yeah, Maybe it's a better thing than yes. see them. Do we know that yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what we're talking about. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Can we start back and yeah, tell the do. residents what a vamp is? Yeah, <laughs> I'm serious. Let's, yeah. let's do this slide here then. Okay, so this is a nice slide out of the University of Sydney helping us localize what this testing even means. Okay, so we have a very grainy labyrinth. It ha we see the cochlea. Cochlea doesn't matter anymore, so it's gone. Instead, we have <laughs> a vestibule here. So, um, in the green, we have our anterior canal and our horizontal canal. In the gold, we have the posterior canal. And then what you see also in the green, more towards the center of the vestibule, we have our utricle. And then in the gold, we have the saccule. And what those colors are differentiating are the, the nerve distribution. So superior vestibular nerve versus inferior vestibular nerve in terms of how they're innervated. And then this helps us to localize where those testings are focusing their, um, um, where they're focusing. Okay, so we have our anterior semicircular canal with the V-hit, lateral semicircular canal with the V-hit, and posterior semicircular canal with the V-hit. Then we have our utricle function with the bone-conducted OVEM, and then sacral function with our air-conducted CVEM. So we're hoping to get this full understanding of all the many organs within the vestibule using these different tests. There are some limitations to them that we're learning, but in general, it is a nice assessment of the full apparatus instead of just the calorics, which we know is just really the horizontal canal, a little bit of utricle, and the, mostly the superior division of the um, vestibular nerve. Yeah? Excuse me, spend one more time. Why utricle is associated with bone conduction and then saccule there? Yeah, and I don't think we know the answer to that yet. It's, this is out of University of Sydney. They've been doing bone conducted for 10 years now at this point, and so that's been their center's experience with bone conducted. Is it because there's something exquisitely different about utricles, or is it because that's just some, a better stimulus and utricles are harder to um, activate? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if audiology is it, has Is it the sound? Idea. Because I know Michael Hamar used to walk up to people and just tap them on the head. Yeah. And, the, and, and that was really the, the, the movement, I guess, or the force, yeah. uh, as opposed to the sound. Well, that, that was the originator, was they literally took a tendon hammer yeah. and would just pound it at the vertex. <laughs> Not pound. Mock. You can tell that to surgeons if we were saying it literally. Don't that it's stimulous. That, that's, yeah. that, that I, I have a feeling, but we clearly have to test that out, but I bet it's stimulus driven. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's still to be determined, right? But it may be. Maybe upright versus supine. 
Absolutely. Water. That's a really good point, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very, very good point. Because generally with air conducted, you have an upright and uh, air conducted O vamps, you're upright. Mm -hmm. Air conducted C vamps, you may be lying flat. And that may have a positional change, especially when we're looking for third window phenomena. All right, so just rounding out this patient, we can kind of go through this a little bit. Oh, how is this SOT? Sorry. We're going to go right oh, back okay. to it. So in terms <laughs> of his rotary chair, we don't have the actual graphs, which isn't nice. But let's pretend like there's low gain and phase lead on these. Mm -hmm. What would that mean to you? Sorry, Kristen, what's, what's rotary chair again? For our oh, yeah. Okay, so rotary chair, we're looking at rotation of the full body. So you're looking at bilateral involvement with rotation. And this is more the mid-range acceleration. So we're looking at 0.1 hertz up to 1 hertz. And audiology, please correct me if any of those are wrong. Um, so when you see this, again, we don't have the full graphs. What does this tell you in terms of what we've already looked at? It's consistent with vestibular problems. Very consistent, yeah. It's a nice... Uh, like the mid-range, like you were just saying, the V-hit is fast acceleration, caloric testing, very slow acceleration. This is sort of the frequencies in between. So you get, it's almost like a frequency-specific sense, okay, how much rotation does it take for the inner ear to sense it and tell the brain what's going on here? Mm -hmm. but going back to the initial point, mm -hmm. patient is awesome, obviously. Mm -hmm. exactly. in my experience, and so could you explain that for the residents again, because they're new to this, but how many causes of vertical plane oscillopsy are there? Right. So there aren't many. What the oscillopsy really is saying, we've lost our VOR. And what all of these tests are are different assessments of VOR from each one of those organs. So we're confirming that he has VOR loss from multiple organs bilaterally. And the bilateral is really important for oscillopsia because a lot of brains are able to compensate for unilateral vestibular loss and uh, make up for that VOR through central compensation, through reweighting processes. But when you have bilateral loss, it's much more difficult to come back from that. So that's where we hear the classic story of the jumping vision whenever they have any head movement and then having difficulty with their vestibulospinal reflex meaning standing upright in uneven surfaces or low light settings because those are taking away your proprioceptive input that you've reweighted towards or your visual input that you've reweighted towards. And that leads us right to our SOT, which is a computerized version of looking at those different inputs to balance, your visual input, your proprioceptive input, and your vestibular input. And so, Daniel, do you want to tell us things? Oh, sure. Um, so uh, sensory organization tests... Uh, you have the patient stand like in a huge chamber, um, and they're strapped in, harnessed in so they can't fall, and they're uh, standing on a plate that senses how much they move. Um, and there are six conditions, um, going from easiest to hardest. So condition one is basically just stand there and try not to sway. Condition two is close your eyes and do the same thing. Condition three is you can open your eyes, but the surroundings around you will move if you move. So if you sway, the everything around you sways. It used to be an actual, like, um, piece of, like, scenery, and it would, like, jerk with you every time you move. But now it's much more um, digital. Like, you, it's like you're, in, like, an inside of an egg, and it's projected, and you've got all this visual stuff. Um, in conditions... Four, five, and six, it's the same where there's vision, no vision, and then confused vision, except that the platform that you stand on is suddenly not sturdy, and it moves with you. So you have to uh, balance yourself kind of like you're on a surfboard or a Ouija board or something like that. Um, and by the time you get to conditions five and six, you don't have uh, som somatosensory cues coming from your feet because the platform is unsteady, and you don't have visual cues because your eyes are closed. So it's usually condition five and condition six where you can't trust your eyes that if you have no vestibular function, you will fall. So you can see, I don't, it's yeah. sort of dark, but it says fall <laughs> there. Fall, fall, fall. fall, 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 fall. Yeah. So right. that, that's, that's what SOT is in a nutshell. Yeah, perfect. So again, very consistent. This is also nice because it can be used in vestibular therapy as a pre and post intervention yeah. assessment. Do we do this on the BERT tech? Yes, exactly. Yes, because it's like an old neurocom. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly, right. All right, so we saw this. So what we're seeing in this patient, the semicircular canal involvement, utricle, we don't know, but we'll say it's fine. Okay, so for this patient, oscillopsia and imbalance, 
what do you want to do for him? It's been going on for a few months at this point. Like he's really miserable. He just mm. had a new kid at home. He's a working healthcare professional. Yeah. Uh, has to do a lot of up and down and this type of thing, moving patients. What are you going to offer him? Yeah. <sighs> BT. BT. <laughs> BT. Always BT. Hero, hero, hero. Yeah. Hero to the you. rescue. <laughs> So BT and then I will vestibular give, therapy. Yes, sorry, vestibular therapy. Th these folks have real troubles. I mean, uh, this is they do not. In my experience, they don't get better, uh -huh. and it's really weird because it's just selectively semicircular canal. I have had maybe half a dozen patients over my many years of practice, and they're healthy young people sometimes, uh -huh. and they've just lost it, and they are visually unstable. You know, every time they're in a car. They can't read signs because everything's bouncing. It's a very, it's like holding it, you know, what you see in that camera jigger. Yeah. And I don't know, you know, we always do MRIs and I've never seen anything. Right, exactly. From it. Yeah. And he has had to stop driving the last few months. Yeah. He's been on FMLA for work or extended leave for work. Um, it's really, really problematic to him. So I offer these patients steroids. I say, we might as well try. You have bilateral involvement. He doesn't have an autoimmune history. He's a man but I'm still going to offer it because how much harm can it do? I always counsel patients, you know. Is this based on any, any physiologic reasoning or is it just Oh, yes, shotgun? absolutely. So we're seeing, oh, well, it's a little bit shocking. Okay. But <laughs> uh, sudden sense neural hearing loss, you're seeing dual involvement. Yeah. What are you going to do for those patients? That's so right. I think of this analogous right. to that. Okay. So offer him prednisone. Interestingly, his oscillopsia went entirely away. After uh, taking the what? 60 milligrams, yep. What Just about oral? It, what about MS? Oral. If it gets better with prednisone. What about multiple sclerosis if it gets better with prednisone? It wouldn't be bilateral. It wouldn't be bilateral. We wouldn't see peripheral involvement like that uh, if it were MS. Okay. okay. We might have seen some extra latencies on oh. the VEMPs potentially, but everything else should have okay. been normal. Okay. So the usual situation is you're seeing them eight months later after they've seen ten doctors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you can see them early like that, that's great. Yeah. Right. Right. This was like eight months after. Oh, really? And they got better eight yes. months? I'm going to remember that. Did they stay better? Great question. <laughs> what do steroids do? We know they're anti-inflammatory. Steroids kind of make everything better for some people. You know, we use them in status migranosis. We use them in acute vestibular syndrome. We use them in brain tumors. We use them everywhere, right? And they can make people better sometimes. We don't know why. But, has the but I would have thought the sensory epithelium was dead. Right. Right? But you can bring it back to life? Yeah. <laughs> he still had some gain. He still had some function on caloric, so we were able to tease out. Mostly, mostly dead. dead. Just mostly dead. Yeah. <laughs> and he's young. He's very plastic. And the lateral nystagmus had to do with an asymmetry. There's a little bit more function on one side exactly. than the other. Yeah, we kind of glossed over that, but exactly right. Yeah. I thought that his V hits on the right were worse, and then he had um, potentially that um, bump involvement, but unclear. Um, oh, we'll get back to it. Okay, so came back though after he was off the steroids awesome. for a couple of weeks. Oscillopsia yep. came back. We repeated the V hits when he was feeling better to see if we could objectively measure this. And Austin might remember this. Oh yeah, and his frequency of attacks increased too. And these sounded very migranous to me. He was having oh, no. lots of light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, and the headache started to increase too. So we started him on verapamil as well. Verapamil gave him some light. It's a calcium channel blocker used really commonly in migraine. Um, I like it because it doesn't have much in terms of side effects except lightheadedness, which he got. Mm -hmm. So he reduced it down, but it still kept the attacks at bay. They went away completely after taking the verapamil. Why didn't you choose verapamil for him? I chose it mostly based on patient preference. Yep, not really a great reason. Okay, so we've started to do this. The steroids have had symptoms come back. We really glossed over a workup for this patient. Is there anything we want kind of in the works to look at, especially with his steroid responsiveness potentially? Autoimmune. Right, so autoimmune. So what would you do for that? Uh, I turn him over to the rheumatology clinic and say, please do it all. Yep, that's fair. <laughs> and they say no. Unlikely, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. Any other thoughts what you might get rheumatology wise? Well, he has no iritis, he has no mm -hmm. unusual rashes, no other stigmata, mm -hmm. you know, historically of arthritis or inflammatory arthritis of the small joints and all that. 
I would get, you know, RF, ANA, ESR. Um, you might want to think about sarcoid as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. likely if it's positive, it's not related. But or as the neurologists say, epiphenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> 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 RF is in the ANA with reflex for me. Um, but yes, exactly. We're looking for autoimmune reflex. We're looking for infective reflexes, um, TB. I know, Dr. Wallian, you've had some experience with that now. But <laughs> um, And then I will do a vitamin screen, especially What's the B vitamin. What's an ANA with reflex? Oh, it, if the ANA comes back positive or high um, ratio, then it will reflex into those less common um, lab tests. For okay. You. They'll start to do their own investigation. Yep. What if Lyme comes back positive? Oh. <laughs> That's what you send to infectious disease. <laughs> run away. <laughs> was that all negative? That was all negative. Yes, that was all negative. Exactly. All right, so these are his repeat V hits. Whoa. What do you think? Whoa. That's way better. Oh, I didn't think so. <laughs> it's like a easy copy thing. So I thought they looked pretty similar looking at, because if you look at this waveform here, it's so dirty, that looks about the same lateral kind of like, yeah. as this one lateral. Yeah, that's a different ear. They're right, they flip the right and the left. Oh, sorry. Well, I was just looking at laterals here, but these lateral look about the same. It's still, okay. All right. But his gains are definitely better. Yeah. So waveforms wise, not so convinced, but gains I thought were better. Except for here and left posterior. Posteriors are bad for him. Here. So a little bit better there. Oh, the and the difference between this picture and the other is just different type of equipment. Mm -hmm. Same test, just different readout. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does anyone want to scan him? I would. What would we be looking for? The tracing. Like your favorite? Uh, well, let's put it this way. It will be normal. But, you know, it's something that is so, I mean, in the acute phase for any sign of gadolinium enhancement within the semicircular canals, perhaps any difference in the fluid pattern or protein in the fluid. Um, also, just looking for things like siderosis, mm -hmm. oddball stuff. I mean, siderosis is something that can cause, cirrhosis. yeah, yep. right, you know, with recurrent small bleeds, doing iron staining. You know, can give you certainly progressive hearing loss. You know, looking for Chiari, it's a long shot, but you know, all sorts of stuff. I, I just because it's such a huge life impact, I would do. And I completely agree with that. Yeah. Anyone else looking for anything else? I think that's a pretty comprehensive list. Intracranial hypertension. Intracranial hypertension. Yes. And you're looking for bilateral vestibulopathy related to that. What's the one? If there's enough pressure there. The low pressure ones get a hydropic picture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, yep. So this is his scan. He has a very interesting hook in his brain. You're fishing for diagnosis. <laughs> 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 that why? <laughs> I have no idea what that is. It's like, just the other ear lobe just yeah. coming through, right? Yeah. Um, but <laughs> things look divine, actually, if I'm like. I mean, the, the other thing would be inner ear malformation potential. Mm -hmm. Maybe they had lateral semicircular canal dysplasia, and that's how it's showing up years later. Mm -hmm. NF2 something. All right, so then we talked about final diagnosis. So actually, Rob has already brought up a lot of these. So my diagnosis is bilateral vestibular hyperfunction. I think everyone was on board for that. Eponym known as Dandy Syndrome. In case you Why? Know. Same Dandy as Dandy Walker. Oh, I don't know. Because Walter Dandy did vestibular, he's, yes, yeah. Walter from Missouri was a famous neurosurgeon at Hopkins and he started doing eighth nerve sections mm -hmm. and would sometimes, because they didn't get better, did the opposite side. And so, <laughs> the, so it was a bilateral oh, eighth nerve no. section. Wow. Dave Dandy syndrome. They had a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah, I knew oh, it. <laughs> 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 I wrote a paper called The History of Eighth Nerve Surgery. I'll, I'll show you. Oh, okay. I'll show all that. I'll yeah. not do my homework. All right. So, <laughs> so hypofunction. Unknown for sure etiology, as most of these are. Yeah. Autoimmune has a compelling 
story here, given his response to steroids clinically and potentially some improvement on gains. So he had been doing vestibular therapy at that point too, and it had been a little bit of time, so unclear. Um, and but you know, interestingly, there is a school of thought that migraine can cause its own form of vestibulopathy. There have been case series that, sh that have actually tracked migraine, showing that vestibulopathy will occur over time. But then there are also larger studies that show that migraine is very common in bilateral vestibulopathy, greater than the general population, about 50% have it. So is this migraine being triggered by a very impactful sensory change, or is migraine actually causing uh, vestibulopathic change? Another potential, especially given his episodes, are sequential vestibular neuritis. Was he having a really, really unfortunate thing of having sequential vestibular neuritis? Really, really rare, but hard to say for sure. Diagnosed him with vestibular migraine, he met criteria, they were classic, migraine is features, lasting at least five minutes, up to 72 hours, and they responded to rapamil, which was nice. And then, as Rob already brought up, no evidence of kind of the more obvious things that we think about, vestibular toxic exposures, bilateral schwannoma, Meniere's disease, history that's progressed over time, superficial siderosis, trauma, infection. What's going I have no idea. <laughs> it's a granulomatous disease. Apparently it affects females predominantly, but I've never seen it before. I don't know if anyone else has. But it was on the list. <laughs> Although probably is, the vast majority will have been ototoxic due to genomycin. You know, they, someone was in the ICU with a horrible sepsis, um, was treated with, you know, usually, you know, uh, aminoglycosides plus the loop diuretic for, and, and, and then they, they recover and all of a sudden people notice they can't get up and walk even though they're decongestion, deconditioned and eventually it's clear. But you can get that pure, especially with genomycin. Absolutely. If you look across the aminoglycoside spectrum, some are more cochlear toxic like neomycin mm -hmm. and some are more purely vestibular toxic like genomycin. It's unusual to get a complete wipeout without some sensory hearing loss. But it does happen. It does happen. But that would be far more common, wouldn't you say, would be the... The, the, the um, orthopedic gentamicin exposure. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Many of those. This is that case series I was talking about following those migraineurs over time, and they develop bilateral vestibulopathy. And then this is a nice pie chart talking about um, one of the larger case series out there, 213 out of the Chicago Dizziness Center, 50% of them idiopathic. And they are very... Um, diagnostically friendly uh, group of physicians, so they would have done their homework trying to figure these out. So we still can't answer it about 50% of the time. But as alluded to, gentamicin, tobramycin, streptomycin, large majority of those that are going to be diagnosable. Um, trauma, Meniere's disease, vestibular neuritis, and then those congenital malformations. Vestibular neuritis, with all the crossover pathways, you can still... Uh, it's, it's, if you get it sequentially. Uh, but how do you really know? I mean, right. I, that's yeah. kind of a garbage diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Right, I completely yeah. agree. It's an yeah. acute vestibular syndrome affecting the peripheral having, apparatus. Uh, are they having yeah. ischemic events? Are they actually viral events? Is What is going on? Is this all part of this autoimmune process? We don't know for sure. I've never seen bilateral. Never <laughs> all right, so for him, we are actually sending him to rheumatology to talk about disease-modifying treatments exactly. because he's on two months now of steroids because the symptoms came back. So we put him back on the steroids. They went away again. Uh, and now he's been off for two weeks, and they're starting to increase back. So it's Would you think about going to some for other form of immune suppression? Absolutely. Or yeah. or something? Mm -hmm. So he's meeting with rheumatology on Halloween. So we'll find out what they say. Huh? And, trick or treat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, really <laughs> trick or treat. Yeah. That's right. OK, I think we have time. We'll go through these, I think, a little faster since we know that. Oh, I know that movie. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty obvious moving, but it has to do with what the patient's complaining of. Yeah, what's the movie? Back to the Future. Great. All right. So, it? so this patient, also young male, 34 years old, he has zaps of dizziness, room spinning. They come on for 30 to 90 seconds when they come on. He says usually they're spinning one direction, usually to the left, but sometimes they'll go to the right. Um, they can be spontaneous, but he can also trigger them sometimes. He notices if he turns his head sometimes, that will seem to bring it on. Uh, it can happen multiple times per day at its worst, but it does seem to come in clusters. He'll have two weeks where it's really active, and then it'll go away for a while, maybe months, maybe years, and then two weeks they'll come back again. Whoa. What he's coming to me for is that this has happened in the past, but now he's got imbalance in addition to this, and he's never had that before. And he's 34, he's young. 
He's very bothered by it. He has a history of type 1 diabetes. No family history of anything else that's going on. And he, too, had his first visual aura <laughs> <laughs> It's contagious. Vestibular <laughs> testing. The universal cause of all the Seriously. <laughs> that's exactly right. You had a nail, you had a hammer. Yep. <laughs> so what do you guys want to know? Anything? Parents? Mother? No family history. Christine. Yeah. Hmm. This happened all his life. Happened for the last... I would say 10 years, but only recently has it turned into an interictal phenomenon, meaning imbalance in between. Mm-hmm. And it hits him spontaneously when he's just sitting in a chair. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The imbalance, does it get better? When does it get better? It does. It's all the time. How long does it last again? Uh, the zaps are yeah. 30 to 90 seconds. Does he hear anything during the zaps? No, that's a really good question. He doesn't. Does it only happen when he's sitting in a chair, or does it happen... Anytime. He could be driving a car. Yes. He doesn't drive a tanker truck or anything? No. <laughs> Luckily, he's a shuttle person, so he, he doesn't have to drive. Other oral symptoms, like pain or rushing or tinnitus or anything? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Puppetry neck movements that set it off? Just sometimes that he turns his head. Yeah. yeah. Not head back or... Mm-mm. Does it always spin the same way? No, the majority of the time it's left, but sometimes it can be right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we can does go. Does he have nystagmus? He thinks he does. Yes, he has not taken a video of it though. But he says, "Yeah, my wife says my eyes jump." Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Never All right. So his exam, our good old framework here. Vestibular spinal reflex impaired makes sense with his complaints of imbalance. Vestibular ocular reflex also okay. impaired. Um, he has the opposite, so he is okay. nystagmus, right spontaneous with fixation denied, and intraburger inter- deviation to the left. Okay. So kind of interesting, some lateralizing there. Audiogram, Matt? Yeah! <laughs> 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 oh, look, he's got normal hearing. Yeah, so. he does. <laughs> All right, V hit time. What do we see? Delay. Yeah. Excuse me. Austin, you can shout it out if you want. Uh, they all look pretty bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when there are arrows. Very similar to our last case, right? We're seeing patch of supplies, yeah. some of them overt, a lot of them covert, um, concerning for a VOR deficit in all six canals. His OVEMPS, he only had air conducted OVEMPS. Absent, we all agree. Yep. See them? Yeah, right there. Sort of a right one. Sort of a right one. It's not very big. Mm, it's kind of a lame right one. Yeah. And the left one, I think we'll agree, is gone. Yeah. Johanna Kristen, she mentioned covert versus overt. Oh, yeah. Um, Saka- catch up, Sakats. Can you explain to your younger residents what that means? Can you explain to me what it means? Resident shouldn't feel too bad. <laughs> I think Emma's got an answer for us. Yeah. It's the, this is the over and it happens like during the actual head movement and then reverse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Covert. Yeah. 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 The over happens outside of it. So the idea them. is thinking of your bedside head impulse, move the head quickly, you see the catch up saccade. That's an overt saccade because we can see it with our naked eyes, but it's over because after the head movement has stopped, so this one, you're then getting your catch-up saccade. So the head is stopped, then you see the catch-up saccade. Whereas covert means that it's happening while the head's still moving. So covert meaning you're not going to see it with your naked eye because they're still moving their head there. You see it with IR glasses? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a a slow down uh, video head. I can't see it. You can't? If you slow down if you slow down the oh, video? Yeah, not <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, in real time. Oh yeah, not in real time. <laughs> not with the naked eye. Depends on the second. So you know you'd have to What's the problem with that? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> if, you, if you do a slowdown of the video, then you can see it, yeah. One, I was going to say, one, one trick that I sometimes do is you can hold the, the iPhone and the patient can take their own video and then you play it back slowly. Exactly, yeah. That's how you can do your own kind of Bush v. Hit. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think you had oh, another point. Yeah. You know, what does that mean? To me, covert um, may reflect some kind of central compensation. Exactly. So maybe they've had this for a longer time and they've had time to. Adjust. Yeah, exactly. That's perfect. So it can give you an idea of how long this has been going on and how well they're responding to therapy. If this is compensated, partially compensated, or uncompensated. Huh, okay. All right. So, them, so yeah. summary. We're getting a lot of dysfunction here, both sides, left greater than right. He did bring an old MRI, just the report, not the actual image, says he has an AICA loop on the right side. And he says that he had a VNG and V hit back in 2013, 2014. They were normal at that point. This is at Johns Hopkins, so I think we can trust them. Yeah. And he had <laughs> and see them absent the left here, present in the right. A rotary chair step velocity showed left hypofunction. So, so the ICA loop what does that mean? is there always. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's not pathologic. I mean, there's always an ICA loop. Mm -hmm. Is it normal to have an ICA loop? Yeah. Yes. Okay. The, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, most point. people you see an ICA loop. Yeah. I mean, the theory is, okay, so normally you have, you have the eighth nerve and you have ICA looping over it. And normally, of course, if it's pulsatile, it's, it's moving. And so what the thought is that if someone has an inflammatory eighth nerve lesion, that it spot wells the P arachnoid, and then, then the pulsation leads to an aphapsis or demyelination. That's the theory. I don't buy it. That's the theory. <laughs> but, I mean, I get people referred, I mean, Jenny will tell you, and I just, that's a normal finding. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, okay. you bring up a really good point. So there's been population studies that say 25% of the general normal population have an AICA loop. So does that actually mean anything? I think Probably. it's more than that. Yeah. You have good quality M uh, Fiesta MRI. It's yeah. almost always there. So given this former information, knowing the new information, what would you offer him, if anything? Steroids. Anti-migraine <laughs> 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 therapy. He's a big guy. We have 80 milligrams, going for that one nig per kg. 80 milligrams daily for four weeks. Wow. And he said his imbalance went from a 5 out of 10 to his... See the guy with the type 1 diabetes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Wow. Yes. And I, we talked about that, and wow. he was willing to try it. Why do you have 80 milligrams? One meg per kg. He's a really okay. big guy. Yeah. What about intratympatic if he's a diabetic? We could have. He wanted to start with the oral. He did great. His blood sugars were fantastic. You got more guts really than I good. He had an insulin Lord. pump, and he would do funny yeah. things to it. Yeah. Okay. Continuous monitoring. Yeah, he was fine. He loved it though, because in addition to his imbalance getting down to a very, very low level, he had no more attacks. Is that because his, his two-week cluster was over, or is it because of the steroids? Right. I know. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm like. uh, I just threw this in. I don't really know why, but it can give you a nice way of looking at the visitor. Oh, yeah. This is what I was trying to explain. <laughs> Thank you. I was, I was reading your mind. <laughs> so good. So this is a nice little schematic showing you how the vestibular function test, rotational testing, is spanning the frequencies. So you'll notice caloric testing is way down here. That's the first day I met Kristen. She told me that. <laughs> it shattered me. Natural head movements are way over here. Right now. So caloric is actually a subphysiologic level, but it has a role, which we can talk about. Um, rotational testing, meaning the chair testing, has a nice range. Do we do extended rotational testing? No, we don't even get to one. Okay. 0. 0.64 is so, 0. 0.64? Yeah. Okay. So apparently you can go up to two, I guess. Really? That's what this paper said. Yeah. Well, what speed does it go like in an amusement park when it loops around yeah. like that? Oh, uh, well, you're on the outside. We spin them in the middle, so they're not. You know, I see. Like, like the teacups, it didn't mind. You still didn't go that fast, but you're, you know, you're way out you there. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> so, this is just a caveat. And to bring up the analogy, you know, calorics really is only one frequency, and that's what we're, are you okay with an audiogram that's only one frequency? No, it doesn't really give you the full story. Okay, so what next? <laughs> we repeated his V-hits. What do you guys think? I already said my thoughts. No change. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> this one I really didn't think changed much. The gain stayed essentially the same. There wasn't really anything going on. Um, let's see. I put the shimps in. I don't know oh, if anyone wants to talk about shimps. <laughs> Maybe we can save that. Let's save shimps. Okay. Okay, so let's look at his imaging here. Uh, who would like to read this? <laughs> Of his eye to live on the right side. Yeah, good job. <laughs> Here's the thing. He also has one. This is just one cut, so it's not great. He also has one on the left side. You got shot. <laughs> and then he's also got this third one down kind of pretty low, actually. What is that? That's Pica. Is That's Pica that? against the ninth nerve. Oh, okay. Well, they called three AI loops. <laughs> no. So, first of all, let's, let's be right. There, there are two Ica loops. Uh, right, exactly. right. Ica comes out of the ponds. Mm -hmm. Right, and then it curls. It loop. There's a loop where it's attached to the ponds, giving in uh, perforating vessels. Mm -hmm. Then it comes out in the CP angle to the IAC, where it gives off the internal auditory artery. That's why there's a bend. Mm -hmm. Then it comes back down and nourishes the cerebellar peduncle. Mm -hmm. So, it, and by the way, AICA is redundant. It's ICA, right? Is there an AICA? AICA, A I C A. Right. Oh, there you go. Ah, there you go. I always call it Aika. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so, I mean, these loops, that is normal anatomy. Oh, I, I mean, that's, like they're all the time. We see it all the time in surgery. So you can. Yeah. You're right. So I don't buy it. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> Do you think it's pathologic? So I think it can be. Yeah, yeah, there's some really interesting data for vestibular paroxysmia, which is what you were talking about, a demyelinating event related to the friction from the AICA having that vestibular or that um, neuromuscular compression. Uh, there are extremes of it, though. So there's a neurosur neurosurgeon slash ENT in New Zealand who surgerizes every single one of these. Oh, boy. And he's convinced that that yeah. does it. Peter Janetta did hundreds of them. Yes. Yep, right. exactly. And, 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 and it was like largely that. debunked. But of course, yeah. he was not nearly as precise as diagnosis. But then is there a correlation between how prominent the loop is on the imaging versus incidence of vestibular paroxysmia? Right. No. There is no study looking at that. <coughs> but instead, there's a medium ground for this. So there are actually vestibular paroxysmia diagnostic criteria. Vestibular paroxysmia diagnostic criteria from the International Journal of Vestibular Disorders, the Barony Society. The idea is that we have at least 10 attacks of spontaneous spinning vertigo, it can be non-spinning, duration less than a minute for the majority of them, stereotype phenomenology, a response to treatment to a uh, sodium channel blocker, carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, and then shouldn't be better accounted for by another diagnosis. So the medium ground is if this patient has a response to oxcarbazepine, that it should count as like a trigeminal neuralgia analog. This yeah. is... The, the demyelinating ophthalmic transmission of the vestibular cochlear nerve right. compared to the trigeminal nerve. Some have, some have suggested that there should be an ABR wave one to three delay mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as right. well. Yep, yep, if exactly. That was true. Because of this um, demyelination, right? Um, so, what most uh, believers of vestibular paroxysmia who aren't surgeons will do is they will prove that they've had a medication response. And then if they can tolerate the medications, they can stay on the medications. Vestibular paroxysmia is really interesting in that you don't necessarily have to stay on the medication chronically. Some people just need bursts of it, and it kind of quiets down whatever irritation was going on, and then they can go on it later on if they want. Other people have to stay on it long term. That's good for the white count. Yes, and the sodium. Right. Um, on, and so they'll use that as kind of their diagnostic criteria and would do that many, many times before they'd ever even consider surgery. So, so very few people end up with surgery. In the surgery, are they moving the leak loop and putting in Ivalon sponge, or are they doing a direct Sponge. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. exactly. so. so the reason I thought this may be possible for him, and we didn't, we have not done the oxcarbazepine, so it's a little bit of a stretch here, because he got better with the steroids, which we can see with irritated nerves all the time. But the reason is the duration is so interesting, and I can't think of something else that would account for it. He doesn't have BPPV that's never been captured. It doesn't even sound like BPPV. He has now clear bilateral vestibular hypofunction that has progressed, and there are papers that, oh, not there, there are papers <laughs> that have shown a progressive hypofunction that can occur in vestibular paroxysmia patients. Um, they'll follow them over time, and they'll start to lose their calorics, they'll start to lose their V-hits, and then they can um, have this long-standing vestibular hypofunction on there. So, Do you have these vertebral system looked at on either side? It was like redundant on one side or something like that. It just seems strange that it was always 
with head turn. Oh, it could be um, either one. So it could be spontaneous or with head turn. And, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, for this, this patient. Oh, for this one. You yeah. mean actually looking at MR angiogram or CT yeah. angiogram and seeing if he had some torsculosity to the vertebral yeah. arm. Maybe we'll see at okay. the redundant side on one side, there's only uh, one feeding side. And What will you do with that information? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So no, it's, it's, it's an interesting point. If it's yeah. a if it's if it's a variant of the vertebra, vertebra basilar, mm -hmm. um, I have seen maybe one or two patients they have one vertebral artery, but mm -hmm. they do fine. Yeah. 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 So, so I mean, I lived through the era when vascular loop to compression, the eighth nerve was in fashion, yeah. and I will tell you the the flotsam washed up on my beach. Right. Right. You know, there's a significant risk of deafness because you're you're manipulating something into the heart canal. And, you know, there's a huge um, placebo effect of the craniotomy. Of course. I yeah. completely agree. I have about 10 VP patients. None of them has gone to surgery. They come in asking for surgery, but they've all responded to medications and stayed on their medications. Yeah. So I, I I mean, it's possible that, I mean, all sorts of things have been tried. In the, the, the history of surgery for dizziness is replete with extraordinary variety of operations that were all reported initially to be wonderfully successful mm -hmm. and then eventually got withdrawn. Mm -hmm. But it, it's really kind of interesting uh, how often that is. It's actually a project I've wanted to write up about that because almost anything you can imagine from That's cervical so sympathectomy to whatever, and it always has miraculous effect on vertigo. Um, for time. follow up is one month. Usually what happens is the surgeon then writes two or three papers about how great it is and does it a whole bunch and then never retracts it or says anything about it. It just disappears from the literature. Mm. This has been going on for about 150 years with, with vertigo surgery mm -hmm. of one type or another. Yep. We need to have a journal of retractions. We should have a journal of negative research. Yeah, yes. I think that's so we'll see what happens with this patient, but I completely appreciate that. Really try and withhold any type of invasive procedure from patients because we have really good medications available to them. There have been randomized control trials looking at carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, and now the latest one that's come out is glucosamide or Vimpat, all of them being um, statistically significantly um, improving for these patients. So all in the sodium channel. Oh, it's seven. Oh, it's time. Okay. Well... I guess we're done. Um, <laughs> two, but we have a lot of really good ones. We could do it at a different time. But yeah. any final questions, thoughts, concerns? That's great. That was wonderful. I had a patient a long time ago that was diagnosed as many years ago in Minneapolis. So somebody gave him genomycin. Mm -hmm. And, you know, didn't get that much better. But then he continued to have some problems. Then he had hearing loss. Mm -hmm. So then somebody said, get an MRI. So they did an MRI. And they had a crucial on the contralateral side. And the neurotologist in Minneapolis decided to remove the acoustic neuron. So then the patient had to do up the opposite. Suicidal. It was my VA patient at Minneapolis. Oh, yeah, there's a, a really interesting um, paper oh, from, yeah, from uh, Dr. Crawford in the 1950s, John Crawford, who had bilateral vestibular hypofunction, and he wrote a really interesting take on it, saying it was the most impactful thing that had happened to him. And I've had cancer patients who have survived terrible cancer treatments and ended up with bilateral vestibular hypofunction and said that was the worst part of everything. Yeah, and uh, you always have to keep in mind, too, I remember a patient but a vascular loop decompression for trigeminal neuralgia, which is very real. Mm -hmm. And um, the patient lost hearing, and, and that is not uncommon. It's about 1 in 20, something like that, with the vascular loop decompression of 5. They never tested the other side, which was a deaf ear. And, and you know, so it's a, it's really kind of sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I have some really interesting Meniere's cases that we'll have to do another time. I think yeah, we should have that to do. And a, a small group session with the residents kind of going over the mm -hmm. basics of vestibular testing yep. and the exam would be great. Yeah. 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 Like, you know, one thing, like, I was going to ask, but you were late on time, but like, because you do some things differently than, you know, like with a lot of your own optokinetic testing and you do go into a lot more. Mm -hmm. And so I think it could be useful, I think, for some of the residents to get a sense as to kind of what they might order if they're not doing those sorts of things versus what they would order, you know, if, if you are or are not. But I think right. that'd be a, 
Did we're in a really interesting transition period. As we're learning more and more the limitations of calorics, it has more specific indications like Meniere's disease now. It's less kind of applicable to all these other vestibular disorders. It's still tied in the VNG to the ocular motor assessment. Yeah. And ocular motor assessment is still incredibly helpful in terms of looking into your central vestibulopathies and yeah. other cerebellar and brainstem disorders going on. So we can't sure. neglect the VNG entirely. I, I'm lucky enough to have goggles, but... Yeah. It's a really good point. Yeah. Kristen, we are very fortunate. Yeah.